Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to Bradford Grammar School and to the latest of our In Conversation series. My name is Gary Woods. I'm an assistant head here, and today it's my great pleasure to welcome back to BGS our guest, the author, Ross Raisin. Ross was born and brought up on Silsden Moor and came to BGS in the late 1980s. After leaving the school in 1998, he studied English literature at King's College London, followed by a period as a trainee wine bar manager, and then he completed a postgraduate degree in creative writing at Gilsmiths College. In 2008, Ross published his debut novel, God's Own Country. It was shortlisted for the Guardian First Book Award and the John Llewellyn Rees Prize. A critic in the Washington Post compared the novel favorably to A Clockwork Orange, and the Guardian said that Ross was a young writer to watch. In April 2009, the novel won him the Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year Award. His second novel, Waterline, was published in 2011. His most recent publication, A Natural, followed in 2017. In 2013, Ross was named on Granter's Once a Decade Best of Young British Novelists list, and in 2018, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature perhaps a sure sign that Ross has arrived amongst the great and good of British letters. Well, I find he's not young anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from novels, Ross has contributed to the Read This series on the practice of fiction writing. He's written short stories for Granta, Prospect, The Sunday Times, BBC Radio 3 and 4, amongst others. He teaches creative writing at Leeds University as part of the Guardian Masterclass programme and he's a writer in residence for the education charity First Story. His next novel, A New Hunger, will be published next summer. So once again, Ross, you're very welcome back to BGS. I do hope that uh, the audience, some of your friends perhaps who are watching this will send in questions. There is a Q&A function on Teams, so do please send your questions into Ross and I will do my best to read them out. So my opening question perhaps is the obvious one really. Tell us a little bit about what you remember of your time at BGS, what you enjoyed here and perhaps some of the things you didn't enjoy so much. Just before I do, um, I might make a note of, uh, that was, that was a, um, I think, accurate introduction, by the way, but, uh, um, except for um, the title of my new ah. novel. No, but um, I like what you just said, A New Hunger. Um, it's, uh, provisionally, it's A Hunger. Ah. But new... Gosh, it so, could have started all here. Then. Started all here. <laughs> yeah, I think about it. Um, so, BGS, when you were here? Um, BGS when I was here um, was in some ways I had such an odd disorienting afternoon being here and being kindly shown around the place yeah. because so much of it is just identical to uh -huh. how it was <laughs> however long it was ago, 23 years ago when yeah. I left you know, just the floor, just the smell of the place the windows the, it's it's, it's, it's it's odd, but then a lot of it is brand new in Spick and Span. Uh, the swimming pool is now yeah. like a massive yeah. um, place where children are just milling around, enjoying themselves. Um, and I've also enjoyed walking down the corridor down there, mm -hmm. seeing the, um, the mug shots of old teachers, right. so many of whom I remember so well. Right. Um, and and remember with a lot of fondness, sure. um, really do. Um, sure. And that's what's what's what quite nice about sure. coming here actually, because yeah. yeah. it has reminded me that I did like it. Um, was it a particular teacher or was it a set of teachers that pushed you perhaps towards doing English at university? Um, well, there are some of the English teachers that I remember very distinctly um, and were very important people in my lives. Most distinctly, I remember Mr. Priory, mm -hmm. um, yeah. who was a lovely man. And I remember, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to, or, or, or perhaps putting it differently, it's very easy to say, ah, yes, that was the guy that inspired me to yeah. do it at university because of this. Yeah. But, yeah. but I do remember specific moments of being taught by Mr. Priory and those have stayed with me and they've stayed with me in ways that I think have influenced choices I've made and, and even writing that I've done. I remember studying 
um, Far From Mud and Crowd with Mr Priory at GCSE. And I remember what a fundamental experience that was for me. I remember, I remember, I remember very clearly um, him talking to us about a particular chapter and being very excited and passionate because that was his style. Yeah. And um, and asking us, what does it mean? Come on, children, what is it? What is this? What are they? What are they talking about? Uh-huh. And I remember me putting my little hand up, saying, "I think they're talking about sex, sir." Uh-huh. And um, and they were. It was the right answer. <laughs> um, and um, I don't know. He inspired me into uh, Thomas Hardy, especially, and even though it's quite hard to pull out the threads of the connections yeah. between my writing and the reading of that, but certainly there's a there's a <clears throat> an interesting landscape yeah. that, and, and and people inhabiting landscape that, that well, is in some way derived from yeah. from that in my yeah. writing. It comes out in your work as well, yeah. Outside the classroom, what what did what were you involved in at school? Um, apart from your studies? I was involved in water polo, rowing, right. um, those sports that at the time were often done by the people who just weren't very good at the, the big sports, like yeah. um, rugby and rugby, cricket, which I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't nice. very good at. Um, um, and music as well, I, I played yeah. the saxophone, I was in the yeah. concert band and the saxophone club and the yeah. orchestra. Very good, and, very good. And uh, yeah, I liked, I liked those things and, um, you know, made lots of friends sure. through, through a lot of those extracurricular things, sure. who I'm still... Yeah. So in touch with great. Um, okay. So after BGS, London beckoned. Why did you want to go there in particular to study? Oh, I don't know. Um, my two friends were going there. Yeah. It's probably as simple as that. Right. Um, okay. It wasn't the lure of the big lights or a disaster. It was a little bit. Yeah. yeah I wanted to. Um, I wanted. To, uh, I went to King's, which is right slap bang in the middle yeah. of London. It's not. It's not a campus-based university, and I wanted, I wanted some of that. I wanted yeah. to experience what that was going to be like, and um, and in fact, getting into it was um, uh, a little bit problematic in that um, I've been going around the school today, and I've been speaking to the teachers, and um, it seems very well, very well set up. But um, there were certain things from when I was here that. Um, I think have probably become a little bit more. Uh, let's. I don't know how to put it. Not, not professional, but um, my A level was. I don't know whether this has gone down in BGS history or, or not. But my A level English, that I needed to get um, a good marking to yeah. get into the university. Um, it turned out when we were in the exam hall, just there, exam hall. Yeah, so weird, you know, um, We'd studied the wrong. The wrong books. Does that ring a bell? I thought you were going to say that. I think there was a, a, a report on Look North about it. Oh, with, was it Stephen, with Stephen Davidson apologising, yeah. having to apologise for me to do the wrong book? Yeah. You did okay in the end, though. Well, as it turned out, um, that worked out very well for me because yes. um, <clears throat> because um, I think the university looked on my application kindly right. because of it. Right. And for that reason, I think, I got right. into Kings and had a good time there. Sure, good, excellent. And then I suppose creative writing as your as your masters after your first degree, was that when you thought perhaps I want to be a writer or was creative writing something that you'd done maybe at school or before? Again, what kind of moved you in that direction? Well, <clears throat> I did do creative writing at university, but at that time it wasn't really a big part of the fabric of an English no. degree. It is now. Yeah. Which is good for me because yeah, yeah. it gives me a job, yeah. and lots of writers it gives them a job, um, sure. an enjoyable job as well. But um, at that time it wasn't. But I did do some creative writing at university, and <clears throat> I wouldn't say that it inspired me to take it up as a career. I wanted to get into the restaurant business actually when I left university. Um, is that the wine bar management? Is that where that the came wine from? Bar yeah? Thing. yeah, yeah. I went to. Um, I went to a wine bar actually when I when I graduated and became a trainee manager at first and then a mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. co co manager, I suppose they called us. Effectively, me and another guy were split into uh, two salaries that, that would have been one salary. Um, 
Um, Can I ask you what, why you fancied that rather than writing? I, I, liked, I, liked, yeah. um, I just really liked. Um, to be honest, I think the thing I most liked about working in that industry is just the community of a yeah. of a restaurant. Yeah, yeah. I, I I loved it, and even after I finished that job, I still worked in the restaurant industry and restaurants and hotels and bars for a long time after after my first novel was published yeah. because I liked working amongst people and having been part of a team. You're, you're a big foodie. Do you like food? I like food. Yeah. <laughs> um, I d yeah, I do like food, but I was never I was never involved in the chefing yeah. side of things. Okay. Although that aspect of my life has come into my writing sure. quite a bit actually. And the, the novel that I've just finished is set in a restaurant. Right. And so a lot of the experiences from working in restaurants, yeah. um, and especially in dealing with and being friends with chefs, yeah. have inspired that novel. A lot of the negative ones, especially, actually. Sure. Well, I always write about the negative things. I don't know what's wrong well, with that. that brings me very neatly on to mm. God's Own Country, your first novel, 2008. I think it's pretty dark, macabre mm. even, really. Tell us a little bit about the genesis of the novel. Where did the idea come from, first of all, to write it? Um, well, I'm just my, my brain is just spooling trying to think what what my answer to that question is because um, thinking about that novel in particular is a bit like thinking about being at BGS. It just feels like a um, oh, a lifetime ago. <laughs> it does, yeah, it yeah. does. Um, yeah. But that novel, <clears throat> um, well, it's partly inspired by landscape. It's partly sure. inspired by language yeah. um, and by the idea of an outsider um, yeah. living in a space that is um, completely intrinsic to them but um, when other people come into the area it creates tension yeah. um, so it's partly about the tension of second homeowners for yeah. example yeah. Um, and people moving from affluent places into the countryside and not having quite the same relationship sure. with it as that character yeah. whose name for a moment slipped my mind. Master, Sam Master like has yeah. with it. Um, yeah. Is, is that is, the North York Moors? A lot of it's set around the North York Moors. Is that a place you know well? I mean, there's a real sense of place in the novel, isn't there? Is that a place that's important to you, or did you just pick that place as a place where lots of off comings often come from London? It's partly and, for that. Yeah. yeah. It's partly for that. It's partly because it's a place that I always loved. The North yeah. York Moors, just yeah. for its vastness and yeah. its um, um, solitariness, I suppose, yeah. Yeah. compared to, say, the Dales, which I also love, but yeah. the Dales is a bit more bucolic. Yes. The North York Moors is a bit more rugged, a bit more, yes. um, a bit, a bit yeah. wilder, yeah. which is what I wanted. But also, I um, I grew up on a more um, a small one, yeah. um, and so a lot of my a lot of my childhood is invested in that novel, sure. in, in a way, just yeah. in terms of yeah. the seasons and um, farming yeah. that was around me and yeah. the, the fauna and the flora. Um, yeah, it's probably the biggest in, impetus sure. for that sure. novel. And you mentioned language as well. I, mean, I was really struck by the protagonist, Sam Marsdike. He uses lots of Yorkshire dialect words. I noticed in the back you, um, you make reference to uh, Arnold Kelly, Kelly's Dictionary of Yorkshire Dialect. Did you know a lot of those words before you started or did you actually kind of look them up? Uh, and did you make a conscious choice to make Marsdyke speak in a lot of Yorkshire dialect words? Well, it was part of, um, it, it was part of learning what the book was for me, because mm -hmm. when I first started writing it, it, was, it wasn't like that at all. It was written in third person and it was much more, uh, it was much more neutral. Right. Certainly there wasn't a demotic element to it, a vernacular element yeah. to it. And in playing around with it, drafting it, I tried it in first person and uh, and started experimenting with language. And the book became much more interesting to me yeah. with doing that. Yeah. And in so doing, um, I wanted to create a kind of a kind of idiolect. Um, so, so a language that is completely bespoke to that character. Yeah rather than a language that is representative exactly of the specific location and in doing that i um i borrowed a lot of language from different places yeah um and made up a lot of language as well there's a lot of um words that i've just made up right that he speaks and very convincing though it sounds like yorkshire dialect 
Well, um, yes, that, that is partly, partly the point, but, um, but it's also in the creation of something, in, it's something completely new. And so the, the fellow that you mentioned there, reference Arnold Kellett, yeah. He's written, he wrote, or he, he compiled rather, a dictionary of Yorkshire dialects. Just yeah. fantastic book. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, and it's a book that, I, that that really inspired me to create something new. And so a lot of the language is anachronistic, or it comes from different areas of Yorkshire. Yeah. And he actually, I wrote to him actually after I'd finished the book and said, "What an inspiration it had been." And he he wrote back and. Um, expressed his displeasure actually with the book because because of its lack of accuracy um which is just quite an interesting thing and it's quite there's, a, there's like a very young beginning writer it was quite yeah, a difficult yeah. um yeah. moment in some ways to to think about oh i've, I've it wasn't the feedback you were expecting yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and um in a way that was quite a good learning curve because uh -huh. it, it is, I suppose, difficult to write anything without somebody being displeased by it. However, yeah. many people yeah, might yeah, read yeah. it and feel yeah. Um, yeah. Um, inspired or, or, or happy about the book. There's always going to be people who are not, and it's important to listen to them and engage with those opinions. So that was a, that was a good early experience of that for yeah. me. Yeah. You mentioned drafting and redrafting. Do you redraft your work a lot? How oh, do you? Yeah. All the time. <laughs> well, I, have a, I, I won't go on at length about this because um, I did a whole session, I did a whole three hour session um, for one of my uh, teaching courses uh, earlier this week on this. But, um, but yes, essentially, to try and boil it down, the drafting process is about exploring. So, so the first draft is an exploration of the idea and trying to find out what the language is, mm. trying to learn the language of the book mm. and the characters and the point of view and the style and all of it. And then and then I started again um, on a blank page. Um, completely fresh. Yeah, yeah, completely fresh. So the first the first draft is longhand with a pencil and then the second draft I own the computer and I write it again having learnt what it is with the first draft. And then I complete it again and then I edit it. And the editorial process is the bit that I enjoy the most um, because it's important. I just love it, but, but it's important to have your own process by which you edit, which you learn as you go, and then you bring into that the opinions of other people, sure. specifically in my case, my editor or yeah. editors yeah. who will give their opinion. And um, the experience of the last two books that I've written certainly has been one in which they've had, oh, they've had a lot of opinion, and um, and it's good because it improves the book. But so the book that I've delivered a couple of weeks ago, I've been editing for a year and a half, um, roughly, and I've, I've just received my editor's last email a few days ago with more notes. So when do you know to stop? When do you think, okay, I'm done now? If you've got a very organised process of writing, like you understand your method, yeah. um, then the stop point is is, is part part sure. of that. Um, sure. So for me, it's about sure. you know you have a number of editorial yeah. tasks, right, and, and you know when you're done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there might be several hundred of them, um, yeah. but you, but they're bullet pointed and they're in a document, and when you've come to the end of them, you've come to the end of them. Sure. The reception, as I said, was, was rapturous. You were shortlisted for lots of awards. A Clockwork Orange, that, that favourable comparison. I haven't read it. Yet, <laughs> I, I was a long time since I read it. Yeah, and the Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year Award in 2009. Um, were you surprised by winning such plaudits? Yeah, of course, yeah. But it's also, it's a... Do you know what? It's easier, it's easier when it's happening um, to say, means nothing. Um, <laughs> And it does. You know, at, the time, at the time, it's, yeah. it's, it's like, well, that's nice. Yeah. And it's nice of people saying things like that and, you know, getting an oversized check for a, winning an award. <laughs> um, but essentially, it is kind of meaningless. But you only, you only really understand that when you then go through passages of your writing life when, you, when you're not winning those yeah, things. Of course. Um, and, then, and, then it, and then you really want it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, I don't know, I think. You know, it's been a while since that first book came out, so I've, I've, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've experienced both sides of it, and 
Um, and now I really do understand that the only thing that matters is, is, is the idea for the next right. book and falling in love with it and finding the language of it and just writing it. And then if you want to, writing the next one and, and listening to what other people say if it's going to help you to improve your work. Yeah. But the plaudits especially, yeah. um, enjoy them in the moment, but then sure. forget about them. Okay, good. I've got a question here from uh, someone watching at home called Tony, who says, how do you carve time for your own writing with your teaching commitments and how important is routine to you? Uh, routine is, 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 um, is used to be um, everything to me. Right. I, used to, I used to be a writer who sat down at nine o'clock and would finish writing at five o'clock and then in various parts of my life would then go into the restaurant to work and then yeah. once I finished that and uh, and didn't have to do that actually at some, at some points then would just stop but then I had children and they screwed everything <laughs> in, a, in a beautiful way but they, yeah they did um, and then started teaching as well which is now a very big part of my life it's probably about half of my right. working life right. but um, being ultra organized is very important to me so at the beginning of every week for example i know exactly the slots in which i'm teaching sure. and the slots in which i'm writing and the slots in which i'm writing need to be protected from everything yeah so it's part of the value of writing longhand because you can sure. put the computer in a different room yeah and not look at emails right. obviously i look at emails and I, it, it's impossible not to but ideally just, yeah. in the purest sense i would I would just leave that space completely intact. Yeah. So God's Own Country, I think you know, it's very bleak. It's also quite funny. I found it very funny in, oh, in, in places. But your second um, novel, Waterline, many critics have said is just bleak. And I think, Ross, you're going to read us a short yeah. excerpt from Waterline. I'll read you now. It is bleak. I mean, th this is... Uh, um, of the novels that I have written, this is the one that I feel most fondly towards, yeah. I think. This is the one that means the most to me. And I would say it's probably the the one that I think is, at least technically, um, the one that I think is the, the best of them. But anyway, let me read a bit. Um, one here, a soft fog of flowers painted on the front there's plenty more like that, plus as well the wild fluorocanes, meadows, bustling hedgerows, a woodland clearing mobbed with bluebells. Hard to imagine there's this many types of card in a supermarket. A churchyard, quiet and peaceful with brown leaves blowing about. A teddy bear, and another here that's for some reason a cat gazing out the window at a sea view. It's Robbie that wanted to put the cards up. He wasn't much wanting to do it himself, but Robbie had dug the heels in. What else are you going to do with them? Stick them in a drawer? Leave them lying on the counter with the funeral programmes and the electric bills? So now the pair of them are in the corridor, fixing them up to the red ribbon that Robbie's fished out from the Christmas cardboard box. The light dimming in the front door. Dull laughter from the living room where the rest of them are sat, watching the television. You know all these people that are? Not really being honest. There were some the day even I don't know who they were. A few would have been from the department store and then the family, of course. And he nods at the living room wall. I preferred no task. I'll stop there. Um, because Great. Impression, but, um, no, lovely, thank you. So that's obviously Mick uh, speaking, if you like, the, the main character uh, whose wife has sadly died. Um, and the novel's about his tragic fall into homelessness. Um, He's another misfit, isn't he, really, Nick? Another outsider. You write about outsiders a lot. What is it that attracts you to the outsider? Uh, I mean, I have my answer for this, but the, it's hard to know exactly. It's, it's very hard to know exactly the reasons for anything that you do when you're, when yeah. you're writing. But, but certainly there's something in the exposure of the normal or the conventional world that they are outside of that is part of the i suppose often political thrust of writing an outsider like that but um the, and with this novel it um uh it had a very specific 
um, genesis, I was going to say, it sounds too grand a word, a beginning. In the, I, and I remember it very distinctly because I was, I was on a coffee break while I was in the wine bar, working in the wine bar, and I was reading the newspaper, The Guardian, um, and reading about the King's Cross fire and about one of the victims of the King's Cross fire who had been identified uh, years, many, many years after the King's Cross fire, who was the last identified victim of it. And in, in and it was to do with DNA in, or the new um, methods of uh, DNA technology sure. in recognition. But he turned out to be somebody who had been sleeping rough in the station. And some of his life was um, then found out about. And I read about this and then I read a book about him and his family. And it's incredibly moving and sad, but it, it, it awoke something in me in terms of an interest in how that might happen to a person and the relationship that it might also have to place and industry and post industry. Um, and so by a series of steps, I ended up in West Central Scotland, Glasgow, and I was very interested in the collapsing of industry there, or the, the, the shrinking of industry, especially the yeah. shipyard yeah. industry. And so, like with any novel that I've written, it's very important to me to go to the place where I think that it might be set and to just to speak to people. I spoke to dozens of people in shipyards yeah. who then um, said things that then led me to other places like asbestos charities who, who work with the families of of people who'd died from asbestos exposure. Mm -hmm. It's a learning process. This is the excitement mm -hmm. of writing a novel for me. Is mm -hmm. It's about not quite knowing what it is at the beginning, but then going on a, mm -hmm. on a path towards somewhere and writing at the same time. And so with, with this, and you'll have heard from the way I, I probably read it out in a horribly bastardised way by now, because it's a while since I, while since I wrote that, but, um, but part of it was learning the language. I'd never been to Glasgow yeah. before I wrote this book. Yeah. Yeah. But I listened to the tapes of the people I'd recorded, and I also worked with a voice coach, a drama right. voice coach, right. just trying to learn, just trying to figure out the cadence, trying to figure out the mm -hmm. music of the language and how mm -hmm. I might represent that mm -hmm. on the line. Mm -hmm. And all of that is is what writing a novel is for me. It's about learning a language, mm -hmm. sometimes very specifically like that, yeah. but it's always about learning some kind of language that is new yeah. um, and takes you somewhere that you didn't no before no. it's about it's about um it's about finding out for me is writing is writing a novel it's not the same for all novelists no. for some for some for some novelists writing a novel is very much about writing um something deeply familiar very known mm. something about the self mm. but for me it's always it's always been it's always excited me more to write outwards sure you used the word political a while ago. That's an intensely political work, isn't it? You've got the destruction of a man paralleled with the destruction of a whole industry and the wealth it generated and the, the sense of pride in place. It's not dissimilar, in fact, to what's happened in Bradford. Are you an intensely political writer? Um, well, I am in the sense that I'm a, I'm a person, I'm a political person. Yeah. Um, but politics in writing doesn't work if you are, if you're putting it on the tin. Mm. Um, well, it's a, bit of a generalised thing to say, but it doesn't usually work if it's polemic um, and you are stating very um, brazenly yeah. the politics Obviously. that you're wanting to do. It has to, yeah. it has to seep outward from the characters. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so, yes, that novel, but all of the novels that I've written in, to some extent, especially the last two published ones, and actually the one that is unpublished yeah. um, are probably uh, probably increasingly political in a, in a, in uh -huh. a way, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And the main character, is he a, a figure of working class grandeur or is he a pathetic figure? I don't think he's either of those, to be, to be honest with you. He's a, he's a man who lost his wife and lost his way, but the b bereavement is <clears throat> is a theme in the novel in that mm. there's the bereavement that he experiences through the loss of his wife but there's also the bereavement that his industry his area has experienced yeah. in the loss of 
in the loss of industry and the loss of community, the loss yeah. of society that has gone with that. And and yes, I think you're right to to, to make the comparison with somewhere like Bradford, which um, you know the, the periods of history are slightly different to yeah. shipbuilding in Glasgow, but the but the um, the essential part of the story is quite mm. is quite similar, mm. and it's um, and it is something that that I think about and something that probably comes into my writing. I took mm. my um, oh, I was going to tell an anecdote, yeah, but you're, you're better. Better. Just a related one. I took my daughter to Bradford for the first time. That's actually the second time, but she's a bit older now. Um, she's ten. To Bradford on, on Saturday um, because me and my son, who's seven, and my dad um, are season ticket holders at, at Bradford now. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first time I've been a season ticket holder at Bradford for twenty-three years. So it's another. My life's just bizarre. It's like it's like I'm going backwards in time. <laughs> Which is uncomfortable. Although being at Bradford City, very similar to <laughs> same <laughs> pies, I imagine. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, similar pies. Um, same people. Um, same football. It feels like. <laughs> but yeah, walking walking through Manningham, she was she was surprised by it because she's not she's you know she's she's lived quite a privileged life yeah. in that she's she, she lives in York now with me family and York doesn't look like Bradford and yes. um and she's not seen you know uh derelict shop after derelict yeah. shop after derelict shop or buildings that have just been left over time um, broken windows mm -hmm. um and she was quite she was quite surprised by it and um it, it was good actually for her to see that and to have the conversation with her on the way back on the train back you know yeah. What you know? What happens to a place? What happens to a society if um, if it's in some ways left behind, or if it's not invested in, um, um, if it's not necessarily cared for as much as other places in in, in society? So it's an interesting conversation to have with it. Yeah. It was a good one. Of course, the phrase at the moment is leveling up. Do you believe that will happen? Um, I believe that there will. The, there is coming a time when uh, enough people understand that that's just a marketing phrase. It doesn't mm. mean the shipyards will never reopen in Glasgow, will they? The textile oh, uh, mills no. in Bradford. Um, no, and I, 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 I feel that um, that that phrase has done more damage than it than ever is going to do good because essentially you've all that has so far happened manifestly is that lots of groups of people have been effectively told that they're not as good yeah. um, they don't have as much value at the moment as other places um, but actually nothing has been done about it so all you've all you've all you've done in a way is demonize sections of society without any actual yeah. um, doing anything about it so is the novel really almost an expression of despair the way things are. Almost a, I, you know, a sense of hopelessness. We, we aren't ever going to make things better. I'm going to say no, mm. and I'm going to say that um, it's really difficult for me to know the answer to that, to that question. Mm. Um, to some extent, yes, I suppose there is something despairing about it. But there's also, certainly I like to think something hopeful about mm -hmm. it in terms of the the the, um, the journey that the main character goes on and um, the, well, I don't want to spoil the plot, but the, the reconciliations that, that sure. he makes. Um, but yes, the bleakness comes from somewhere. I wish I knew exactly where it does come from. I don't think I'm a particularly bleak person mm -hmm. in person. But some of my writing is it is quite bleak, and there probably are things for me to investigate about that. Um, sure. But I don't really want to. <laughs> <laughs> so your third novel, uh, A Natural, took a bit longer to come out. I think it was 2017. Did it take longer to come to fruition for a particular reason? Hmm. <clears throat> I had children. Ah, right. 
Yeah, uh, according to the way. Yeah, that's what it was. And also, um, also, my um, earnings from writing were not as were not as were not as much. I think that was probably partly what it was. Yeah. Um, and so I started doing other work, like teaching work. Right. Um, and in a way, I feel, really, I feel like I've, I've been so fortunate because with the first two books, um, I think that I hit a, a moment in publishing when uh, it was I I got an advance that was able to support my writing for a sure. sustained period of time, yeah. and then the the world collapsed, the economy collapsed, yeah. publishing really struggled in yeah. lots of ways, and um, yeah. and I think like lots of writers. Well, writers have always have done lots of different things as well, but um, yeah, I started doing other things. But you know, that said, um, which is there's a part of me that would like to just be writing every day. There's definitely a bigger part of me that's much happier to now have teaching in my life because sure. I because I really love it. And obviously, my children, you know, yeah, of course, yeah. they're they're a, hap they're a happy intrusion. Yeah. So the protagonist in this novel, Tom. Perman is a talented young footballer who's gay, struggles again to come to terms with his identity, uh, in particular his homosexuality. So again, another outsider figure, really. Would you agree? Yeah, he's very much an outsider figure. Um, and and the interest in that novel was partly born, well, partly born out of an interest in football. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I've always been a football supporter, but it's also born out of a, a discomfort with the fact that I love football, I love, I've loved going to City since I was a small mm -hmm. child, mm -hmm. um, but I know that football's got a lot wrong with it. Yeah. Um, and there's a tension there for me, it's a conflict, and that became quite an interesting one to think about in terms of writing, writing a book about football. And particularly, yeah, and it became about sexuality, um, but it's also about youth, it's about adolescence, and it's about the way in which the football world creates products they create yeah you know especially the, the it's, high the, it's the money isn't it really it's the marketing that's all behind it now yeah the, 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 yes and the people's game has almost been subverted by money is that what, you're, what you mean it's partly, it's partly what i mean and and yeah they are they are churning out products essentially yeah. the academies of the mm. uh, the bigger clubs mm. and in so doing they're creating um they're creating a kind of isolationist world for these adolescents who are you know, things are slightly improving now mm. but they're, but they're, they're creating a world in which they are not they're shielded from the outside world mm. because they don't really want them to have contact with the outside world because that that causes problems and so there are a lot of young people growing up through football academies, football clubs, who are not having a proper education in lots of different ways to do with um, to do with the real world, yeah. and that's and I find that deeply troubling, actually. Mm -hmm. And part of the way in which that um, manifests itself is in terms of understanding if you are a young person like this main character. And in that world, outside of the bubble, mm. you you might um, understand your sexuality more. You might understand that you're gay, for mm. example. But in that world, my feeling is that a lot of those people, those young people, they don't even know what it means. No. It? Not properly. No. This is his situation, sure. certainly. And so what he feels is this huge discord, this discomfort yeah. with himself, within himself. Yeah that um, yeah. that he doesn't quite know how to yeah. get out of it. You said, uh, I know you're going to read to us again in a moment, you said in an interview with The Guardian that football doesn't fit neatly inside the label of literary fiction. What did you mean by that? Uh, I wonder if that's changed since I wrote the novel. Not, not particularly. Well, um, there are a lot of football novels, I suppose it's the no. simple way of putting it. There's David Peace's novels, but yeah. um, and there's my novel, and there's one or two others, but they're mm. um, certainly historically they're not what novels are about. No. Football no. football is um, no. uh, uh, football is is base in, in a way, I suppose football is baser than the novel. Right. Um, it's probably why the 
never have been that many, but yeah. but, but now I think there's a the world certainly the world of contemporary fiction is, is, is different to what it was, you know, sure. twenty years ago. So um, <clears throat> it feels it felt certainly at the time of writing the book like it felt like ripe as a playground for writing a novel because there's so much that's interesting right. just at the same level to write about. Sure. You're nodding at me, you want me to well, read, read yeah, a bit? Very kindly said you're gonna read us a short extract yeah. from um uh, and yeah. I'll, this will be shorter than the last one bit that I read. This is um <clears throat> part way through and the main character Tom um has uh, he's developed an interest in the groundsman who's called Liam and this is their first moment it's the first moment I suppose yeah. it's not a sex scene sorry sorry it's not, it's not gonna be a sex scene um, that's just a bit it's a few pages on from this um, Liam was about to open the dustbin when Tom reached forward to clasp his arm Liam shifted his eyes to him Tom let his hand fall to his side and gazed down at the paint pot still in Liam's hand, his boots, his own trainers stained green. He was conscious of how fresh and clean he was, this close to Liam's work clothes. A dim thrum came from the road. He could not bring himself to look up. Liam moved away and Tom watched him step back to the table, hearing then the unbearable clunk of the paint pot being put down. Tom turned to stare for a long time out of the doorway at the wide abandoned field. He heard Liam's boots on the concrete floor, and then he felt the warmth of his body behind him. A hand touched Tom's side, pressing gradually against it. Tom pulled himself away. He twisted to look directly at the large face, and he was charged with a sudden glorious sense of risk as the man stood there, inspecting him. I have to go, Tom said. He made for the clubhouse, not deviating to avoid the patches of mud. Above the road noise, the baying of seagulls, was the sound of blood in his ears. His vision was constricting, the sky, the world around him, closing in until all he could see was the door of the clubhouse ahead. Okay. That actually, um, that little nugget that I just read yeah. there was um, initially part of a short story that preceded the Okay. The novel, um, which is part part of why the gap in publication was so long, because sure. initially it was a short sure. story, it was quite short. Yeah. That was the central scene, yeah, yeah. and actually that scene didn't yeah. end like that. It ended with more bodily contact than that. Okay. But sometimes you yeah. write something short, like a short story, and it excites something larger. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes you write a short story and it's done, it's closed. You want to move on to doing something else. But sometimes it's, it stays with you and you think um, there's actually something larger that I want to sure. consider and learn and think about. So with this, it was about adolescence and liminality and football clubs generally and about sexuality and about... Um, it, it's set in the south, isn't it? So again, there's dislocation because Tom's not from the place where he has to go and play. He has to leave his hometown to go and play. So you've got that, that same theme again about repression, I suppose. It's not yeah. really about football, you could argue, or not, not, not entirely about football. Well, it's not so. about football. No. I mean, it is about football, but you know, it's not about football. No. I mean, the dislocation is part of the nature of the young player's life. Yeah. Um, yeah. In that you are, you know, sure. and often you, you won't have choice sure. In, sure. in where you're sent to. I read the critic, I'm not sure I agree, actually, who said that the text in this novel is quite plain and sparse, a contrast, for example, to, to God's own country. I mean, do you agree with that? Um, the bit you read there didn't strike as particularly plain or sparse. It, it, I mean, it's. I mean, it's not steeped in vernacular no. idiom. No. Um, but it's it's written so. The thing that I'm saying about writing a book, writing a novel, is about learning a language. Yeah. Even a book like that which is plainer and sparser than other things that I've written, it's still about learning that language and understanding why you're creating that language. Mm. So this is a book about, I mean, essentially, this is a book about repression. Mm. And so there is a repressed quality to yeah. the language that, yeah. that, that is in a way symbolic of that. Sure. Sure. 
It's also that plain doesn't sound like a compliment. Does it? Not really, but yeah. I, I, I can understand that the, the, the repressed language also being reflected in the, the repression in the novel. Yeah. Father-son relationships. I mean, again, all all your novels have that father-son relationship, and you've also talked about going with your own dad to Bradford City. Again, is that an important theme for you to write about father-son relationships? Well, it probably goes in that category of things not to <laughs> things I don't want to to, to try and understand. Yeah. Um, but it seems to be, yeah. yeah. Um, and also about sort of the trouble that masculinity is in, you know, this idea about modern men being under the cosh and so on, the crisis of masculinity. Is that another theme you wanted to touch on? Well, it, yeah, it really is. Because every book that I've written, including the one that I've recently delivered, yeah. is in some ways about masculinity. Sure. Um, and so if I was to explore it, the reasons, um, there's definitely something in an idea of me not feeling fully comfortable with the idea of some ideas, some versions of masculinity, and maybe me feeling outside of them. I don't, I don't know, but certainly, yeah. and the, the character that I've, the main character that I have written in the newest book mm -hmm. is a chef, and she's a woman, right. and so she's. Um, very much in the minority in the kitchen sure. and the industry that she's yeah. in yeah. and a lot of the tension a lot of the a lot of the difficulty and the darkness actually of this new novel is parallels a lot of the other things that I've written it's about it's about the not fitting into that and it's about the um, the dangers and the difficulties that a particular especially masculine work culture or club culture mm -hmm. can can create um, what, whether that's got something to do with me and my own dad, I don't, I don't know. Might do. Um, and that's out next year, is it? That you've finished the redrafting process, that's gone to press or not yet? Uh, well, I'll see what my editor says <laughs> when I speak to her tomorrow, actually. Right. Um, but her latest email to me suggests that um, it's maybe not quite run its course. All oh, right, a bit more work yet. Well, it's a, it's a, oh, it's a joyous process. I, I really, I'm so lucky because yeah. the, the people that I work with brilliant yeah um but you know i've been editing this novel for half, right. which is partly my own process but it's partly informed by the conversations that I've with my two editors who um are very clever and they, they work separately two editors they work together, uh, they, work together. They, work, they work together it's a slightly necessarily the, the normal way in which it works usually you have an editor yeah. who works with you with the, and sometimes they might they might suggest to you that they might give it to somebody else for another opinion. Sure. But I've worked very closely with two editors with this book and, yeah. and the football book as well, actually, a natural. Sure. A couple of questions coming in here, just as just a few minutes left, really, uh, both anonymous, I'm afraid. Which book did you feel was the easiest to write and which was the hardest and why? Um, I would say the easiest to write is probably being the the newest one. Right. I don't really know why. No. I don't. I really don't know why. Um, it's just happened that way. That I, I suppose part of it's to do because it's, it, part of it is a formal thing because then it's it's is the new book. It's got a formal element to it that okay. I won't say what it is actually, but right. um, I wouldn't label it experimental. Others might do, but but something so bespoke, so new. But in a way, I found that easier to write. The, the one that's been hard to write definitely was Waterline, the, um, the yeah. one that I read from that's yeah. set in Glasgow. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think part of that is because it's a book about bereavement. And I was writing that at a time um, soon after my wife's um, mother died. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really realise quite the, the, the impact on my writing that it had sure. until in retrospect I think I think my wife pointed it out to me yeah. but, but it's often like that with writing you don't quite know at sure. the time of writing what's going on you, but you look back over your shoulder and yeah. you think oh right yeah that was because of that that's why that was so sad to write that sure. another anonymous question here do you have any interest in exploring other media forms that might bring your work to a different audience um, Yes and no. I mean, obviously the answer is yes, but yeah. 
Oh God, that just, um, it, it's so um, heartbreaking often, the, 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 the screen yeah. and stage side of like, adaptation. Mm. And there's been, you know, a couple of, two moments of time in particular when it looked like works that I've written w would be adapted for screen, yeah. um, either for film or for TV. And for various reasons, it's not happened. The most, the most one, one quite recently actually. The this football novel, an actual, was was greenlit for a BBC. Um, I don't know if I should talk about this, but it was greenlit for a for a BBC television series. Yeah. Um, along the line, not not it's a very different book to normal people, but the format and the, right. the BBC three, BBC yeah, yeah. one idea. Yeah. yeah. And that was supposed to be happening probably around now, actually, but um, uh, the 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 writer director of it pulled out, and with his pulling out, so did the BBC, and so did the production company, and so it was left nowhere. And you know that I think is that's just what happens in yeah. television, especially. Right. But to me, as a you know, as a novel writer, somebody who's used to having autonomy and just doing yeah. getting on with my own yeah. thing, yeah. that's a different world sure. and sure. one that um, sure. it's difficult to understand and be in. I think. You mentioned you're teaching a lot. Obviously, you teach creative writing, I think, in Leeds now and as part of the Guardian Masterclass programme. It obviously is something that you find, you know, really exciting. What do you get out of it? Um, well, it's um, it's a privilege to, to work with writers of any age um, and see their brand new stuff, you know, sometimes that they're creating, doing writing for the very first time. Um, and I, I enjoy, I enjoy helping them to make it better. I enjoy the technical side of it as well. I enjoy analysing work and thinking about how you might encourage your writer to make it better, whether that's a primary school child or whether that's a pensioner. You know, I work with both, yeah. um, and undergraduates and MA students and and adults, and it's um, uh, it's been a real eye opener for me actually because I never imagined I would enjoy doing that but it turns out I didn't so that's worked out well. Fantastic. <laughs> You're also involved I know in a, in a charity, a writing charity called First Story. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what that involves, what, what does the charity actually oh, do? First Story being the best thing that's ever happened in my working life to be honest. Right. It's, um, it's an education charity that works um, with schools across the country but primarily in disadvantaged areas and they place writers in schools in residency um, to work with the same cohort of children um, across usually two terms or sometimes one term um, just doing writing workshops in poetry in fiction in creative non-fiction and then produce an anthology of their work at the end of it and I've and you know I've, I've I've left the two schools that I was at in London because I moved. Yeah. And I feel really sad. It's probably one of the saddest things in moving, actually, it's especially the well both of the schools um, because I was I've been there for a long time in both of them and made some friends and made incredible relationships um, and seen children grow. You know, yeah. you know what it's like watching, yeah, course, watching yeah, a child yeah, grow absolutely. older yeah, through yeah, 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 yeah. through school life. Is that, uh, it, does it happen in Bradford? Is it uh, in some schools in Bradford? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So first, first story, first story. Yeah. Quite, um, uh, prominently in Bradford. It's one of right. their main areas, certainly of West Yorkshire. Right. Um, uh, yeah, so it's something I'm hoping to return yes. to. Right, excellent. Well, I'm really sorry that our time is up for us. The time has really uh, sped by today. So thank you once again for coming back to BGS today, for speaking to me. us about your work in, I think, really fascinating way. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you this afternoon. I hope that the people at home watching have enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All the best.